So my first film, this guy let us borrow his equipment. One of the camera people knocked over his camera and it fell and boom, cracked and bent one of the lens hoods on it. And I was like, oh, shoot. We ain't got no, we got 5000 Tanya, what am I going to do with this freaking $10,000? So, so it was... It was, that was oh, a big no. old no moment at, for me at the time, yeah. but it ended up being not so big because the person who let us borrow, he was so cool about everything. Welcome to The Practical Filmmaker, an educational podcast brought to you by the Filmmaker Institute and Sunscreen Film Festival, where industry professionals talk nuts and bolts and the steps they took to find their success today. On today's show, we chat with faith-based writer, director, and actor, Anthony Hackett on funding, distribution, and how he navigates investors for his feature films. Find the full transcripts and more at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. I'm your host, Tanya Musgrave, and today we're joined by writer, director, and actor, Anthony Hackett of indie company Sunset Friday Entertainment, where he writes, produces, and directs feature films with an intent to share positive messages. Films include Love Different and Hope Lives. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, The Practical Filmmaker. I love the name, too. You know, The Practical, come on now. You got to be practical with this thing, you know what I'm saying? Some people just try to just do too much. No, relax. Be practical. I love yes. it. So, yeah, there are going to be some practical questions thrown at you, but we'll start off with how you got here. That's a lot of hats that I that I rattled off. What's your journey been? Well, you know, the indie filmmaker life, you got to wear as many hats as needed until you can afford to not need them. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. you you keep moving. And then sometimes, you know, even when you can afford to not need them, you still like wearing them. You know, you like you like certain things, whether it's directing, writing, acting, producing, editing, you know, all those things. So I started off as an actor. I started theater and then I transitioned to film, doing some doing some behind the scenes stuff, you know, background work and stand in on, on uh, big sets. And then I moved on to like doing commercials and acting in uh, films and shows, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, one day God just gave me this, this, this buzz, jump into the filmmaking side of things, you know, behind the camera. I got inspired to do that and I uh, loved it ever since. And, you know, when you work at a level with a smaller budget, you kind of have to fill holes that you can't afford other people to do for you. Mm -hmm. So I just started yeah. learning the craft of different aspects of filmmaking. And that's the general gist mm -hmm. of how it began. You've worked with studios before now. Take me back to that day where you landed that first big contract where that was the case. I'd love to have been a fly on the wall for that conversation where they're just like, hey, you're going to get paid for this. How did that go? The acting side and filmmaker side's a little different. Actually, it's a lot different. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a little, it's a lot different. So it was about starting small and building a foundation of supporters, of people who enjoyed your work. So I just started off doing like little short films, almost like short video skits. And I dropped them on YouTube. A lot of them were a comedy based, a lot of them were Christian based, you know, to, to fit the audience. And I developed okay. an audience on YouTube. I just wanted to produce stuff and I'm good with comedy. So yeah. I did yeah. that. <laughs> and so I built this audience. And as I built the audience, when you have an audience, things come a little easier and faster with mm -hmm. regard to getting the attention of maybe bigger platforms or distributors or other mm -hmm. filmmakers with regard to getting funding. Yeah. All those things help when you have a little bit of an audience. And I don't have a huge audience, but I do have people who support me because I spent time to give them content for free. And, and that How just kind of are you talking subscribers? Both subscribers and just followers, you know, like okay. just all over social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram, YouTube, whatever. Just okay. like just that little buzz of a following. But that's all it takes is a little buzz, you know, like it just mm -hmm. it just takes a little bit of support. Like when I say a little bit, Tony, I'm talking about like like me and you. Right now, and the Practical <laughs> Filmmaker Squad, you know, we can get together right now and make a little short film something, and then these <laughs> these however many people can make this thing grow because each person knows one, two, three, four, five, six, a hundred other people. Yeah. And so as long as you're producing something good, mm -hmm. whether it's content, quality of it, et cetera, then people will talk about it and then mm -hmm. they will share it and then it mm -hmm. just grows. So it doesn't take a lot of people, literally me and you together right now could be the next mm -hmm. freaking <laughs> whoever, the, the the biggest, bestest female male tag team in filmmaking <laughs> ever. So it, it's, it really can happen that way, but it does take, it takes a lot of pieces to fit, but it doesn't take a lot of people to start to build that following. 
All right. So a couple of questions. One, when you say, yeah, it doesn't take a lot of people to build a following, but like uh, when you're saying it doesn't take a lot of people to spread that, how many kind of are you thinking? I mean, like there are people who are just like, oh yeah, it doesn't take a lot. Just, you know, like maybe just like one or two million instead of, you know, and you're just like, come on, come on. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I, I mean, how, how small of a following? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you have? I got you. Well, so here's the thing. It's not always about quantity, it's about quality. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, it's not always about how many people are seeing your stuff, it's about who sees your stuff. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So I actually did uh, my very first, 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 first feature film ever. It's called Crisis Call. I did it a long time ago, like 2014 or something. But mm -hmm. my first feature film ever. Mm -hmm. That happened immediately after I was doing like the video skits and stuff, but the reason why we were able to do that is not because we had a huge following. It's because the people that were watching me do those mm. short films and things on YouTube, mm. a couple of them, literally just a couple, a few people wanted to invest and support into that in a big way. So for that first film, we had one person who watched our stuff who said, you know what? I want to give you guys the equipment to do it. I got hmm. cameras. I got equipment. He came down from New York, Tanya, wow. brought all his equipment down. Okay. We shot on Panasonic GH4s at the time, but a bunch of other equipment. He brought all that stuff down, multiple cameras, everything. He brought it down. He let us use it for free. Yeah. No, nothing. Yeah. Dang. Because he enjoyed what we did. Yeah. We had another yeah. person who was watching us and said, you know what? I have a catering company. I'll cater your whole set. Stop. For free. I yeah. Said, and that's oh, the best part. It's the food. <laughs> That's all you need on a good set of some decent food. So, <laughs> so all of these things started coming together just because not a whole bunch of people, but the right people yeah, was yeah. watching yeah. and saw. And what some people don't get, some filmmakers, when you begin this process is we're we're in an age of numbers. We're in an age of we got to get 100,000 views. We get, if, it's, if it's not getting a certain amount of views or mm -hmm. attention, it's not. No, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. You just have the yeah. have the right people watching and you mm -hmm. never know who's watching your stuff. Mm -hmm. You never know. So for yeah. me, it's just about, yeah, you want to continue to build on the quantity as much as possible. Just build, build, build. But remember, it's not about how many, it's about who. Mm -hmm. And that's my thing. I want to be able to put what I'm doing in the eyes of the right people. I'd rather one executive from a nice place see my stuff yeah, than yeah. a million people. Because yeah. that one executive can get it to five million people. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. about who. And and that's what I was, that's what I was referring to. That's how kind of I, I had a following, but the right people were watching at the right time to help mm -hmm. me grow. You know, when you're talking about who and the right people, that also means that you have a very specific audience in mind. And mm -hmm. I know that everybody is just like specialize, specialize and get that niche audience, which kind of sucks sometimes as an artist. But, you know, again, it is also a business. And I wanted to talk to you about that business side and creating something for a specific audience. Right now, you have landed pretty squarely in the faith based market. Have you worked with Pure Flix from the get-go or did you make it and then go to the studio for distribution? First of all, I like that you brought up the point of, of being niche. I, I do think that that does play a huge part in helping to develop your following as well as the people who are going to see your stuff. The, the more niche you are, depending on who that niche audience is, the better, because you're going to be, you have an audience and you know who to target and marketing is a huge piece too. I don't know if you're going to touch on that, but marketing is a huge yeah. piece in what you're doing. So but do yes. with that being said, the niche audience is great. I personally pursued the faith-based niche. And that's just, you know, where my calling is. I, I enjoy the opportunity to produce great content, but also has a, a message and able to share my faith. Mm -hmm. So we produce content directed towards that audience. I can't let you guys underestimate the value of film festivals. Mm. First, we put the love different in film festivals and we worked the film festival circuit in our niche audience. So we targeted faith-based film festivals. We got accepted to one of them, the largest Christian film festival in the world in Orlando, Florida, the International Christian Film Festival. Mm -hmm. The film got selected there. And uh, when it got selected there, we strategically planned our release date of the movie around the time that it was going to screen at that festival, mm -hmm. because we realized that maximized our exposure. Yeah. So we did that. And it released the day it, it, it screened at the festival and it was available on a place called Christian Cinema, where you can actually purchase or rent Christian mm -hmm. films. 
Uh-huh. Well, we became the number one purchased slash rented comedy in the history at the time, in the history of Christian cinema. Wow, interesting. We were able to reach out to Pure Flix, having some ammunition to show them, hey, this is what our film is doing. It won this award. It screened here. And we're, we're trending number one on Christian cinema. And so Pure Flix at that time was, was interested. And then we were able to strike a deal with them at that time because we were able to come to them with value behind mm-hmm. our film mm-hmm. the small hint to that we actually reached out to pure flicks before any of that happened before we got into film festivals we had a finished movie we was like oh let's just contact pure flicks and see if we get it there yeah. and they didn't want it at the time yeah but it didn't have any ammunition behind it it was just a movie yeah and sometimes yeah. as filmmakers we get so excited about our film and we think it's the dopest thing ever and mm-hmm. it could very well be but mm-hmm. it may not be a good fit for a distributor because the various reasons, even though mm-hmm. it may be good or not good. When you yeah. have ammunition behind your film to mm-hmm. make them interested, then that helps a lot. If your film can bring an audience to that distributor, they'll want it. Yeah. And you have to be able to prove that. Yeah. Not it just be a good film. You have to prove that people are going to go watch it on their platform. And mm-hmm. so we were able to do that with love different. And that's how it started. And then once you start a relationship moving forward, you already have the relationship and you can always now reach out and Mm -hmm. and keep it going. I would love to talk about the contracting process because I feel like that is the shrouded in mystery everywhere. (laughs) A lot of people have gotten burned by these contracts and I'm curious, you know, that bad contract versus, you know, this one I'm guessing is, was better. What was the difference? (laughs) <laughs> so the first time around with a film that I was producing, I went with the distributor and to going with the distributor, meaning that this person or, or company goes out and gets deals for you, whatever the case is, they'll even help market or package your, your product. So I went a with distributor, them. not a sales agent. It's a distributor. Okay. It's a distributor. It's a okay. company, it's a distributor, but the distributor oh, okay, okay, okay. distributes them to different places. Cause they kind of do the same thing, but it's okay. They also distribute it. So anyway, so we did that and uh, I didn't know anything, Tanya, about it was my first time ever. I didn't know nothing. I was like, oh, you want you want to sign our movie? Oh, let's go, let's go. <laughs> so I took it, send me that thing. So I took it, I signed it. I mean, I skimmed over it. I didn't really read it. I ain't had nobody else read it. I just kind of like looked at it. It was like, oh, this looks good, cool. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, no. Boom. <laughs> did not know that I signed over my <gasps> my whole life, you know, like my whole film, like, no. like they had, they had the licensing rights to everything worldwide for multiple years. Once those years were over, they could automatically re up on those years. <gasps> they, they, the, the money, you know, they, they're supposed to um, pay out a certain amount each month. Once they get a deal, basically, once I signed that deal, I never heard from them again for years. Oh my I haven't gosh. heard from them for years. Still and now. I recently heard from them, literally recently, this past year, I've heard from them back. But I didn't hear from them for years. They they took the film. But here's the, so here's the good thing. They got the movie in Walmart. It was in Target, Best Buy. It was, it was available all over. They rebranded the whole movie. They did a great job at all of that. Yeah. I just ain't seen none of the money. Oh my god. Not a dime, yeah. Tanya. Uh, not a dime. Uh, they didn't even contact me to say what they did, how much they made, how much all this stuff. So long story short, that's what happened. Really, really bad. But I learned a huge lesson. Yeah. About yeah. how important contracts are and how important it is to be heavily involved in understanding your contract. Even if you're working with an attorney, which of course I highly recommend, but not everyone can afford that. So if if you can or can't. You just need to be highly involved in understanding every single thing, because if you don't understand it, it could be a problem, you know? So anyway, I learned that lesson and it's never happened again, ever. Mm -hmm. Every deal after that has been awesome by the grace of God. But I learned a valuable lesson there and I encourage people, you know, there's ways to get important contracts, you know, looked at and stuff for very Mm -hmm. inexpensive, you know, you can go online and find people inexpensively uh, if you don't know anyone personally, but definitely see if you can get people for, for, for big deals like that, you know, you definitely want to do that, but there's a bunch of details in the contract phase, you know, that are important to know about a good contract, which you should or shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. That's a 
It's a whole nother process of a conversation, <laughs> but. Well, what's one yeah. line? What's one line that you would look for that you would say, absolutely not? There's a bunch I say absolutely not to. <laughs> one would be, we want all licensing rights to your film. Worldwide, every territory, everything. We want it all, right? Mm -hmm. In most situations, not everything. Depends. Mm -hmm. Like if you're signing a deal with like Sony Records or something, <laughs> you know, all right. Sure, Sony. <laughs> but, you know, for these other, you know, smaller distributors and stuff, if they want the rights to everything to your film, that means you will not have any opportunity to sell or do anything with your film anywhere in the entire world. They have complete ownership rights to, to license your movie and you can't do anything with it, meaning you're putting all of your eggs in one basket with that one distributor where they could they and then they could shelf it. They mm -hmm. could not even do anything with the daggone film and you, know, the, and you can't either. And now mm -hmm. the film's just sitting there mm -hmm. because nobody's selling it to nobody. So yeah. that's a huge thing for me. Also, exclusivity, non-exclusive mm -hmm. versus exclusive. Never do exclusive deals unless it's worth it. So exclusive, for those who may not, who are watching, who may not know, the difference between the two is exclusive means you're exclusively working with that particular distributor. Mm -hmm. Non-exclusive means you can work with that distributor and then that one and then that you, you there's your non exclusive you can work with whoever. Yeah. You want to keep your options open always because some people may have connections that that distributor may not have. Mm -hmm. And now you stuck because you signed an exclusive deal and nobody else can deal with it. So yeah. Those would be just a couple things. This is a zillion, yeah. but those are a couple things that I red flag. Okay. Anything that you would see, one line that you would see in a contract that you would say automatically yes, 100%. No, there's nothing I will automatically say yes, because there has to be a lot of lines <laughs> that make you say <laughs> automatically yes. This there's a lot of lines. You have to, there's, there's not one. There's, there's, you can say one line that would definitely say no, but mm -hmm. there's not one line that would definitely say yes. Yeah, I think I remember seeing this other thing. It basically says, yeah, you're going to get X amount of dollars, but after we do a marketing run kind of a thing. But the thing is, if there's no cap to the marketing, they could uh, attribute like a hundred grand to marketing, you know, so you would put a 25K cap on or whatever. Yeah, I mean, one, th one way to tackle that is to make sure that in that agreement, you, you say zero marketing dollars is put into it without written consent from the filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So the filmmaker has to approve mm -hmm. every marketing dollar that is put into it. Interesting. That okay. way they know for sure how much is being spent and they can't do it without you. That's a big, that's that's one way to, to make sure they don't screw you on that. When you talked with this particular studio or distributor, Pureflix, um, did you work with them again starting your next project? Or was that something that came separately got you so no i didn't work with them what we did okay. is we you know we produce our own project and then we reach out to them once it's done to see if they want it or not we're we're currently seeking an opportunity to actually produce something specifically for them normally it's just we do a project mm -hmm. and then non-exclusively we'll get it out there and, and see what we can do with various different places and platforms all right. So the next thing I wanted to ask you was about budget levels. So indie can be a range of from, you know, the the lowest of the low zero dollars, you know, don't pay for anything kind of thing. And then like Lord of the Rings, <laughs> like, <laughs> where were you in this realm of budgets? Yeah. So our first film we ever did, it was a feature film we did for $5,000 and a lot of volunteer people, a lot of people who were like, you know what, let's ride. We're going to do this together. But again, it's the first film I ever did. And I just wanted to do something. You know, a lot of times we just feel like it can't be done. A lot of filmmakers are holding on their feature from their features because they feel they don't have enough money or whatever. Nah, look, you just got to get it done. And if you have something special for that feature, then just hold that one and do a different one. The way I normally do stuff until you don't really have to do that anymore is I produce backwards. Hmm. So a lot of times filmmakers, they have a script or they'll get their script, they'll write their script or they have it written, whatever the case is. And then they go out looking for everything they need to accomplish that particular script. Right. I reverse it. Hmm. I don't write nothing. I try to raise as much money as I can Mm -hmm. I look at different locations. I talk to different people. I get all of the resources I can possibly get up front. And then 
I write a story based around the resources that I have. Interesting. That way, once yeah. I'm done writing the script, it's guaranteed that the movie will get done because I already have everything in place for it. I have this much money. I have this house that I can film at because they said I could film there. I can mm -hmm. film at this business because I already talked to them. I can use these actors because we've already had a communication. Like I, I get all that together. So with the first film, we were able to do it for $5,000 because before yeah. I even wrote the script, 85% of that first film was done inside of one house. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a friend who had a really big house and I asked him, yo, would you let us film here for like a week? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was like, yeah, sure. Here are the keys. I'll be gone. I'm going on vacation. I'm like, oh, snap. All right, cool. <laughs> wrote, a, wrote an entire movie where most of it was based around that one house. Yeah. Because that's what we had. So yeah. that's what worked and still works even to this day is, is producing backwards. Forget the script. Now, you can have an idea for a story. It's not like yeah. you don't have the idea. Yeah. But yeah. don't write details yet until you know what details you have. So that's what I did. And, and, and I still do that, you know, even to this day to an extent. So that, that first one was 5,000 because we produced it backwards. Love Different. Love Difference was Love Different was $50,000. We produced mm -hmm. that entire feature film mm -hmm. for 50K. Mm -hmm. And uh, the majority of that was produced backwards too. You know, like mm -hmm. I didn't really fully have the script until I knew some resources like this business I could film at you know, reached out to these people. The only time where you really, really needed the script is when you reach out to actors, like name actors or mm -hmm. celebrity actors or actors that are a little more high profile. Mm -hmm. They obviously need to see the script. So before mm -hmm. you reach out to them, you have, a you have, you basically, before you reach out to them, you should already have everything anyway. Yeah. You, should have your script, <laughs> yeah. you should have your money. You should have your, yeah. you should have everything before you reach out to those people. So, th because you never want to reach out to them and then now all of a sudden you can't do the dang movie because you don't have everything. So that was 50K. And then my last film that we just did, the feature film was hopefully as we did that for $100,000 was our total production budget for that film. Again, these are very, very, very inexpensive prices for an entire feature film. When yes. I say very expensive, yes. you know, for those who are watching who may not know, yeah. low budget feature films are like $2 million, <laughs> you know, three like, to $5 million. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's low budget. And then all, even ultra low budget is comes in at like 200,000 to 500,000 that's 800,000. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. did it for 100k. And again, you mentioned at the very start of this thing the different hats that mm -hmm. I had that I wear. Well, a lot of the reason why we're able to produce at such a low budget is because of those hats that I mm -hmm. wear. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm able to act, I'm able to direct, I'm able to produce, I'm able to edit, I'm able to cast. You know, mm -hmm. all of these things you just do what you got to do. So you can get it done. So those are the, the budgets for those particular films. Very low. But mm -hmm. if you notice, it grew each time. Yes. And so yes. each time we're yep. able to be blessed to go more and more because we produce something of best quality we could. It, it did well. Then the next thing you just keep growing. Mm -hmm. You keep growing in your resources, your networks, and then your talent evolves. And mm -hmm. then money is just going to come from that. So our next one, Lord willing, will beyond well beyond 100k so that's <laughs> that's the process of yeah it. yeah 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 and you know we we kind of glaze over the money part as in like yeah the money's gonna come how did the money come to you <laughs> absolutely so that that first film we just did a crowdfund and mm -hmm. you know we were able to raise like five thousand, and then from that we just we volunteer people volunteered for that one as well for love different it was a combination of investors we had two investors and then some crowdfunding. Specifically, the investors came from my beginnings of what I was doing by just building an audience. And then Hope Lives, it was just continued evolving. So now Hope Lives was actually produced 75, 80% of my wife and I being able to come together. It was a God blessed event. So this was just God blessed because the funds came through an opportunity that my wife and I had. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get a large majority of those funds mm -hmm. just from what God blessed us with personally. So it was a risky play, mm -hmm. <laughs> very risky play. And then we didn't have enough though. So then we had to go to a couple investors, which are in this case, were a couple more, two people that I knew who knew work that I've done. One of them was the same investor from Love Different. And the other one was a new investor who seen Love Different 
mm-hmm. who watched it and yeah. said, we want to invest in a future project of yours. Wow. So that's kind of how the, the funds came together in those situations. I know they always say like, never put your own money in. You know, I, I'm just kind of curious. Is it job in the meantime? Yes, no. Or is this, is this, uh, this, your, your full, this is your full <laughs> yeah. bread and butter? So well, you this do- and, you know, acting, I still do, you know, acting, sun, entertainment, Sunset Friday, and I dabble in investing a little bit, but Ooh, who okay. doesn't be made? <laughs> All right. All right. Yes. I mean, you did mention acting and directing, and if I'm not mistaken, on the last one, you did both. You acted and directed. Was that right? Is that correct? Every feature I've done, I've, I've acted and directed. Okay. All right. So what is that experience like? Because there are plenty of examples out there where a director decided to be the main actor and everybody around them was like no no bro don't do this to yourself (laughs) and sure enough it it is kind of detrimental to the whole process so what is that experience like for you how do you make sure that you're not one of those in the statistics got you so real quick before i just address that i just want to address real quick you you mentioned the don't put your own money in thing oh, that people yeah. say sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I just totally disagree with that so wholeheartedly. Really, when really, people really. Say that because it's almost like having debt. You know, mm. like if you if you get money from someone, mm. it, you know you you kind of owe them, but you kind of don't. Like it's their investment, so it's like you don't necessarily have to. It's not something you have to pay them back per se. Yeah. But but you feel obligated to pay them back, you know, because you're yeah. you're you're basically borrowing their money but Mm -hmm. for them it's an investment saying you know what i know the risk i could invest in this i could lose it Mm -hmm. or not Mm -hmm. but at the same time it's like you it's always going to be on you like man this person trusted me so much that they put x amount of dollars into this and you feel obligated that you need to get them their money back and it's just this weight of that Mm -hmm. and i don't like the idea of that i don't like the idea of debt i love the idea of if you believe in yourself, put if you know if you have it. Obviously, if you don't have it, it's something totally different. Mm-hmm. But if you have it, go ahead and put the risk up yourself. Invest in yourself. Put the risk up because guess what? At the end of the day, you're gonna feel great because you don't owe anybody. You're mm-hmm. like, hey, I ride or die with this, but my conscience is clear. I feel good. It's such a good feeling to know that you don't owe anyone even though you kind of don't anyway. Wait, 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 wait. So this sounds like you're speaking from experience. So you've been able to pay back all of your investors? For the most part, not everyone, no, absolutely not. But again, you don't have any control over that. At the end of the day, it's like, that's why I'm speaking from experience of the feeling of knowing that you owe these people kind of, Mm -hmm. and you can't pay them back. You know, it's just that simple. Like you don't pay them back. And that's the part of it. That that's, what's important to know. Like, if you borrow money from someone or people or whatever the case is, it's just going to weigh on you, even though it's an investment, even though you don't technically owe them, but it's still there. And sometimes in some cases, it hasn't really been in my cases, but in some cases it can hurt that relationship. Mm. It can hurt a relationship. Like it can mess up friendships or, or whatever the case is. It's just, it gets messy. Put the money in between two people it can get messy. And so I, and to stay away from that mess, I just like to, if, if I'm able to, I want to put in my own or I encourage people to really put it on. Now I'm not talking about go into debt, like get you put on some credit cards and stuff. <laughs> That's still debt too. Now you just owe yeah. a bank. It's just the idea of investing in yourself, believing in yourself and it, whether it goes up or down, you know, it go. And then on the plus side of things, 100% of that profit goes directly to you first, 100%. You don't owe anybody. Like when you when your movie starts making money, now you don't have to put out the first to pay them off first. And now you still don't see no doubt. No, mm-hmm. you pocket it all because mm-hmm. you put it in. So anyway, yeah. I just want to say that, address that real quick. I know it was well, off topic from your no, question. No, 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 no. I'm just curious. What's the biggest amount that you've paid back to an investor? It wasn't a lot, man. Maybe like five, ten thousand dollars Yeah. But I haven't borrowed a lot. And that's the thing. Yeah. Like, you don't. Yeah. I don't borrow a lot. Like I'm not yeah. a... Again, some of these people were borrowing hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars from ah, people. Yeah. And so that's, you know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. If you're going to spend even a hundred thousand, like if you, if someone invests a hundred thousand dollars in you, like you got to, like, you're going to owe them that money, you know, yeah. or your, your, your film owes them that money. Yeah. I've never 
borrow that much from any investor like at all ever and never would and, and you know i never i never would i just can't do it so yeah yeah okay. i would i would definitely suggest people go in if they can or so i remember somebody saying like hey when you have a lot of investors that could actually be detrimental to a studio looking at something wanting to bring something on because they're just like oh man that's so complicated there's so many people that like oh waterfall contracts and like oh these people need to get their money back and these money and all of our profits are going to get eaten into by all these other contracts and a lot of investors might not look great going into a studio situation but my question for you is is that even in the cards of like what you want to do do you want to go into a studio situation where you don't have necessarily that creative control and that kind of a thing i guess it will kind of depend on the deals you have with these previous investors what that looks like in detail mm -hmm. i think it's about the big picture you know mm -hmm. like the big picture is not how many investors do you have involved, but how much money do you owe people? You know, mm -hmm. like, all right, let's say you have 10 investors, but total between all these 10 investors, you owe them a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Well, I mean, the big picture is the studio would just be like, look, all right. So it's going to cost us a hundred thousand dollars to get these investors off our hand and we can take over or whatever the case is. That's just kind of depending on the details of. Yeah. Because maybe maybe one contract with one investor you have says you owe them ten percent in perpetuity forever. I was like, what the freak? <laughs> like that's the kind of stuff where, where yeah. we go back to those contracts, and it's like yeah. it makes sense. But yeah. with that being said, definite. I've never I've never worked with more than two investors ever, and I never would. I don't. Well, I don't see myself ever doing that. I, mm -hmm. You're you are right, kind of what you're hinting at with regard to less investors, the better, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to work with more than three max, mm -hmm. max, and each one of them would have similar deals that I would have, it would be too crazy. So yeah, mm -hmm. it is important, I think, to minimize how many people you're borrowing money from. If you need more money from a lot of people, that's called donations. You go ahead and you <laughs> ask for donations from as many people as you want. But yeah. when you have to pay yeah. people back, yeah. That gets yeah. complicated. So keep it very minimal because now you have to pay them back. You got to keep track of all those people and what are their percentages and all that crap. Nah. So yeah, definitely minimize how many people you're borrowing money from or investors you have invested in, in my opinion, as especially on an independent level at least. And then, you know, as many donations as you want. But with regard to the distributor aspect of it and kind of, I know you mentioned about relinquishing control of or being in, in some sort of agreement where you have less control. I think that's totally fine if you're going into it knowing that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going into it with a desire to have creative control over a project you're doing and the distributor's like, no, nah, we want to have control, then, I mean, don't do it because you're going into it <laughs> yeah. knowing that this is what they want. Yeah. But if yeah. you go into it saying to yourself, you know what, I'm not producing my own project anymore. They're basically hiring me to produce their project. So if you want to go into a situation where you're producing someone else's project, mentally, you're already in that mindset and you're fine. That's totally good. You're getting paid. You're producing their project. It's their rules. Cool. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't. And you say no. And you say, you know, this is what I'm willing to do. And people respect that. You go into any negotiation with anyone in real, anyone in life, period, but specifically in filmmaking, you go into a negotiation, you say, this is my standard. This is where I'm at. I can be flexible here, but people will respect that. People will respect when you know what you want and what you're willing and not willing to do. Nice. Nice. Okay. So now we are going to go back to the acting and the directing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're back. <laughs> and we're back. Oh, so yeah. What was that experience like? And like, what is it that gives you that self-awareness to make sure that you aren't one of those director actors that falls through the, the cracks? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, acting and directing, Tanya, is is not for everyone. Hmm. However, it can be for anyone, <laughs> if that makes sense. It, it's 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 really just for me. It's really just a process of having the gift. Number one, I think you do have to have a level of a gift or talent to be able to do both. And then it's a matter of the team you have around you to be able to accomplish that. Specifically with me having a good DP, mm. a good director of photography, if you're going to be directing and acting, 
a very good director of photography and or like a specific person, you can call him or her an AD, an assistant director, you can call him that for this purposes of what I'm talking about. But when I when you switch from director to actor, you have to have, and when I'm actor, you have to have someone on the other side who can take over in a directing mode. Mm-hmm. You have to have someone to be able to say, all right, and you know, you know, I need you to do this, that, or that wouldn't look, that would look shaky, whatever the case is. So the team you have around you that, that, and not a whole thing, but just that one other person who can step into your role as director, in a sense, during the scenes that you're in, while you're actually acting, while at the same time, here's another big piece, while at the same time being able to respect their role, Mm -hmm. because their role is not director. Yeah. And sometimes you can work with someone and if you're a director and actor and then you switch from directing to acting, now this other person steps in, sometimes you can get a person who gets this mindset of now I'm the director. I'm the captain now. I'm the captain. And then not only that, but they, they overstep their boundaries on what they're able to do. So that's why I said you have to find the perfect fit, a really good DP who has mm-hmm. the ability to be able to step into a director role and, and be able to guide the director actor and all that stuff while at the same time being respectful of their role and being a great person. That's why like, for example, Nathan, I think Nathan fits well with me in that respect. Cause I know he can direct. Mm-hmm. I know he can DP. I know he can do multiple things, but when he knows he's in a position that we were in where he's the DP I'm the director actor, but he can step in and, and, you know, take on some responsibilities, but at the same time, respect the role and everything else. It's a perfect fit. That's how it works for me is having a good teammate Mm -hmm. with your DP and or an assistant director, and then having some dang skill. Like if you suck, look, you can't, you can't, you can't do anything professionally if you suck. All right. You got to get, you got to get some talent. You got to get good. And then, and then you can step into that. You have to be very comfortable. You can't go from a director to an actor. And then you're leaving one of those things behind because you're so focused on one or the other that the other one falls behind you. Your performance and acting is going to be pretty whack or your yeah. team is going to not like you because you're not good at directing the team. So Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to be pretty good and then and then have a good teammate. So, you know, you're talking about the roles that you found that were really important, like whether or not that was an AD or a good DP. What is a role that's surprising that you found that you needed? Like, like I'll give you an example. Coming straight from college and doing indie projects and, you know, still at the level of producing independent low budget films, you know, Again, we were talking about wearing all the hats, but getting to that next level, I remember somebody coming and talking at one of our film and media events, and he was an accountant. And I, it made perfect sense to me, but he's just like, when you are in a bigger studio film, that is one of the first things that they look for is, do you have an accountant? And, you know, it makes perfect sense because like they're looking for somebody to protect their investment, like they have big money into you or, you know, what have you. Now, obviously, you have talked about your investors and, you know, they're they're looking at you and investing in you as an artist. But what is a role that you were surprised that you that, that came alongside you that you didn't know that you needed? A script supervisor. Oh. A script supervisor on set is I didn't you know my first couple of films I never I didn't have one but you know my recent film I had one she was amazing and I'll tell you it was like a, a script supervisor can can almost make or break your movie they they're like really? they they their their sole job is to keep everything right and tight. You know, the continuity, making sure you, because you have, however, you have a bunch of people on set, but you, I'm sure you may have seen a movie or show or something where you're like, how did, how did that get, how did they not (laughs) see that, that her hair was dripping on the side when on the other side, it wasn't like that stuff happens often, but a script supervisor's sole job is to help those things from happening. And some of the worst things in movies is when you're distracted by something that could have just not been a distraction just because mm-hmm. somebody caught it. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. a good script supervisor is one that I really never really appreciated or, or you know, whatever. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, again, again, when you're talking, you mentioned accounting, make, leads me to think about budgeting. A lot of times you're, you may not be able to afford that extra person who could be a script supervisor. You kind of mm-hmm. have to, 
select yeah. your crew based off of how much money you got. And yeah. you may not have the money for that. Yeah. And so as our budget increased, we were able to continue to increase on multiple people that we yeah. could add different pieces. So yeah. definitely for me, a script supervisor is one, just one that yeah. I undervalued. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you about some tools of your trade, a gear or gadget that is an old <laughs> reliable or a resource. Uh, I mean, good DP. <laughs> That, that's my that's my my resource that I feel is old reliable because, yeah. you know, a good DP knows all of that stuff. Once again, I'm not a DP. Yeah. I'm a director. I'm a writer. I'm an actor, producer. I'm, I wear many hats, but DP mm -hmm. ain't one of them. So mm -hmm. I'm not the most technically savvy. You know, I got some I got some skill, but I'm not a DP. I'm, I don't know all these things. You know, I can do some lighting, but a good DP can do some lighting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like. A, D, a good DP is that Swiss Army knife that complements another director who has a good vision, a good visionary director, and a good DP with their technicals can just make magic. So that would be my, I know that's a different answer maybe than what no, you're looking no, for. No, 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 that's a good, that's a good one too. <laughs> but a good DP would be my resource that's all reliable. You can't, you can't beat a good DP because they, they know it all and okay. I need that. Okay. All right. Well, what about your favorite new resource that revolutionizes how you work? Oh, okay. Again, another another different kind of answer yeah. that uh, you probably would not be expecting. A new resource that revolutionized the way I work is money. The the <laughs> money that I did not have before. So, and that's why I call it new because you get the more money you get, the more, the more you're able to accomplish, it, re it revolutionizes what you can do. When I look back at my first movie we did for $5,000 mm -hmm. and the last movie we did for a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. It's so it's, it's a stark difference because <laughs> of how much more we were able to accomplish more yeah. people on set, more crew, more actors, different name actors, more food, better food, better locations, more locations, better equipment, lighting, Everything just drastically revolutionized the difference in the filming mm -hmm. and money. And we'll call it new money because that new money is that that money that's more than what you had before. Mm -hmm. And with each dollar, each hundred dollars, each ten thousand dollars more, you're able to do more. And it helps yeah. to revolutionize what you're doing. So I would say that new money nice. is that new thing nice, for me. Nice, nice. So, I mean, I, all right, obviously film is film and Murphy's Law, totally in effect, things go wrong. I love asking a significant oh no moment, something that went wrong. <laughs> so my first film, this guy let us borrow his equipment and the oh no moment was when one of the camera people knocked over his camera <gasps> and it fell and boom, cracked and bent, the, bent one of the lens hoods on it. And I was like, oh shoot. That, we ain't got no, we got five thousand dollars, Tanya. What am I gonna do with this freaking ten thousand dollars? So, so it was, it was that was oh, a no. big old no moment at, for me at the time. Yeah. But it ended up being not so big because the person who let us borrow, he was so cool about everything. And uh. but that was, it was big for me at the moment because it was my first film. Someone would let us borrow their equipment. This dude freaking clumsy behind, dropped it, bent the dang thing. I was like, oh crap, we're in trouble. So. Oh. Oh my gosh. That was one of them. <laughs> no, no, no. I can totally relate because yeah. when I was in college, we were filming my senior project and we were shooting with the red one. And mm -hmm. that one was, it was set up on a tripod on a dolly in the other room. And all of a sudden we heard this massive crash and we're just mm -hmm. like, no, it's the camera. And of course we go in there and it had, it hadn't been tightened on the, you know, the, the fluid head. And oh, so man. it had like slipped forward and mm. it wasn't sandbagged. Yay, students. And oh, <laughs> it, yeah, crap. it fell probably about the height of six feet crashed. Yeah. So that was... <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did, was it okay? What happened? What? Um, I mean, okay. So, I mean, there were some things that busted on it. And of course, Red liked to have all of their specialty screws that you could only get from Red and you're like that kind of stuff. And, you know, we did have to pay, I think, the, the deposit on it, on the insurance part of it. Mm. <laughs> so there is that. But, you know, it was insured, thank goodness, because it was, it was equipment from the university. But yeah, it was a dark day on set. Like everybody at school the next day, I mean, everybody was just walking around like this 
us for a while. And like <laughs> when they when they approached us the next day, everyone was like, they were so reverent, just like, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> that was no. nice. You can tell uh, you went to a Christian school for that mess right there. <laughs> <laughs> First, are you okay? Nah, heck nah. You in a secular school. They were like, what happened? <laughs> What'd you the do? Freak? Coming out your tuition. <laughs> Dang, that's cool though. That's cool though. Good. <laughs> Praise God you were okay. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, but so I, I, you, you did hint at a more significant, oh no. You said like the small one or the big or the significant one. Which one did you mention? Oh no, first? no, I was, I was just, I was just referring to that. It was big. That same one was big for me at the time. Oh, oh, okay, but okay, it ended okay. Up not okay. being too, too okay. bad. Okay, all right, all right. Because I thought you were mentioning two. It'd just be like, oh, well, there's nah. a small one and a significant one. It was we like, were okay. actually. So I, I would say this. We've been actually very blessed with the projects that I've done to really not have any significant issues. We really haven't. We we're really, really blessed. Like uh, one thing that, and this is for your Christian audience. Anyone in your audience who may come from the Christian faith, mm -hmm. I would say this, that prayer before, during, and after your, your projects is weighs a lot, in my opinion, because we've yeah. done that and we've been very blessed to really not have any significant issues. Every, every film that I've done has been very smooth and really good. Even the issues that we've come across like that, hmm. you know, ended up being not being big. Another issue yeah. was on my last film, we, oh gosh, so my last film, Tanya, this, we had an actor, he was a day player and he contacted me the night before he's about to show up, contacted me, mind you, like, I mean, the director of the movie, like, should you, this is something maybe you should talk to somebody else about. Yeah. He contacted me via email, I think, via email at that, who says you gonna look at that and said the next day he was like, can someone pick me up from the train station? I said, what the freak, what do, who? <laughs> I, no, can't nobody pick up the train station. You're supposed to get to set. How I was like, so I wrote about so it. I was like, report. unfortunately, no, I, I I can't. I don't know anybody who could pick you up. You know, I apologize. You know, he's supposed to find his own way, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Come the next day, we're filming, Tanya. He ain't even show up. Oh my The God. dude didn't show up. And yeah. he's a and he's a role, he's a day player. We need the dude. Yeah. So even that, like having an actor not just not show up the day mm -hmm. you're supposed to film mm -hmm. is a big deal. Yeah. But yeah. by the grace of God, one of our extras who was dynamic was able to step in, was upgraded to a day player role and filled that role and killed it. Ah. So again, yes. prayer plays a big part in things, in my opinion, from, yeah, yeah, from yeah. my faith and perspective. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. At, at the very least, it will put you in a mindset that can roll with the punches. Maybe I should revisit you after you've had a set completely fall apart. And I want to know, <laughs> I want to know what your perspective is after that. <laughs> That's well. a good point. You're exactly right. Mm. Because that prayer or that, you know, that time, you know, just with God and just, it puts you in a peace, mm -hmm. like a peaceful place where you're able to, to go ahead and tackle Mm -hmm. whatever you need and whatever comes your way you're you're at a peaceful place where you'll be able to address it yeah yeah well i'm wanting to wrap up with a question that i always ask what questions should i have asked you maybe it's something you would have gotten to but just maybe like what would be your advice to filmmakers potential filmmakers or people who are interested in the craft the first thing i would say this this is only again for the christian audience is mm -hmm. to just stay prayed up it's very very important because from my perspective god is all things and he will help you do whatever you need aside from that practically um and i know it's kind of cliche but i'm gonna put it in a way that is is maybe something different you've heard before and that's to not give up Mm -hmm. Right. So the reason why I say that in, and because someone once told me, as long as you're prayerfully going after something, the only way you'll never get there or the only way people never get there is because at some point in their life, they gave up mm. some, yeah. they just gave up at some yeah. point in their life, they quit. And that's their guaranteed way of not making it. And <laughs> yeah. as long as you don't quit, you always have hope. Mm -hmm. You always have hope. You always have an opportunity because you haven't quit. And I said, there's only going to be two ways that I'll stop doing what I'm doing. Filmmaking, acting, etc. There's only two things that can happen. One is I die. And two is God changes my heart. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. You know, sometimes you may have a passion for filmmaking or acting or whatever the case is. And then you start to, you start to feel that passion mm -hmm. for what you're doing fade, mm -hmm. but yeah. it doesn't just fade passion for something else starts to creep in. Mm. If that happens, that's okay. Yeah. That yeah. means that it's okay. You can let go of what you thought you always wanted to do mm -hmm. and you can follow where that passion is leading you next. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But if that passion has never left you, that means you're doing a disservice by not going after it. Oh yeah. And you're quitting. Yeah. And so as neither of those things happened for me, I ain't dead. <laughs> and my passion for what I want to do hasn't left me yet. <laughs> so would... I'm still going forward. But nice. I would encourage people the same thing. Never quit unless there's just no hope left for you, meaning you ain't here no more. Or two, that the passion you have has transitioned to something else. Not just left you. That's mm -hmm. a big thing. Mm -hmm. If your passion just left you, but nothing has replaced it, that means it's still there. Mm. You're, just, you're just disheartened you're just frustrated. You're just upset, but true passion is going to follow something. Nice. And so it has to transition to something else. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say. Nice, Don't quit. Nice. How do people find you or follow your work? Sunsetfriday.com. S O N S E T Friday.com. If you just go to our website, you can figure everything else out, our social media and our films we've done, and you can contact me through there as well. So sunsetfriday.com. Nice, nice, nice. Anthony, this has been the most enjoyable conversation. Thanks so much for sharing your experience as an indie filmmaker. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you. And listen, don't just say that. You better mean that. Because if I watch another daggone video that you interview and you said to somebody else, oh, this has been the most enjoyable, I know she was lying. I have she actually not said that. Well, I, I don't I don't think I have. I don't think I've, <laughs> I've hey, said fascinating before. As of this date, it has become the most enjoyable. So I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoyed this interview, follow us right here and on Instagram. Ask us questions and check out more episodes at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. Be well and God bless. We'll see you next time on The Practical Filmmaker.